Så får jag be de ärade ledamöterna att inta sina platser. Så. Ärade, ja, just det. ärade Nobelpristagare och gäster, ärade utskottsordförande och ledamöter, mina damer och herrar, varmt Välkomna till riksdagens forskningsdag och vårt avslutande seminarium. And a special welcome to our distinguished guests, the Nobel Prize laureates professors Emmanuel Charpentier and Reinhard Genzel. Jag tog initiativ till den här dagen för att ge utskotten möjlighet att ta del av ny kunskap inom sina respektive beredningsområden och för att lyfta fram vetenskapens värde för politik, demokrati och parlamentariskt beslutsfattande. Jag ville också i riksdagshuset på ytterligare ett sätt lyfta fram Nobelprisen som en fantastisk tillgång för vårt land. Vi genomför som bekant olika aktiviteter under Nobelveckan i december varje år. Men det här blir ytterligare ett sätt att lyfta fram Nobelprisen. Här i riksdagen fattar kammaren varje år tusentals beslut som påverkar vårt samhälle. För, de förtro för att de förtroendevalda på bästa sätt ska kunna möta dagens och framtidens utmaningar behöver vi tillgång till och kunskap om relevanta forskningsresultat. Vi behöver förstå vår värld. Vi behöver förstå människorna. Så enkelt och så komplicerat är det inom både forskning och politik. Var och en av oss försöker göra det här i vetenskapen och inom andra fält. Poeten Maria Kyschen har skrivit vackert om hur förståelse utan fakta är dikt eller vansinne. Fakta utan förståelse är en röst som ohörd ropar i rymden. Bättre kan jag inte uttrycka betydelsen av att riksdagens beslut vilar på vetenskaplig grund, formas utifrån partiernas olika politiska övertygelser och fattas med förståelse för hur det här samspelar. Det är min förhoppning att den här dagen blir ett bra tillskott till det utbyte med forskare inom olika discipliner som riksdagens ledamöter alltid har inom ramen för utskottsarbete, politikutveckling, olika nätverk eller på andra sätt. Tidigare idag har utskotten hållit seminarier där forskare har redovisat aktuella rön relevanta inom utskottens respektive beredningsområden. Nu går vi in i andra halvlek med ett gemensamt samtal och på grund av covid-restriktionerna så kan vi inte samla så många ledamöter här, men vi har i vart fall med oss ordförandena från riksdagens olika utskott. Jag är också mycket hedrad över att vi har två så framstående forskare med oss och jag ser fram emot att få ta del av era erfarenheter, kunskaper och synpunkter. För sällan har väl forskningen haft så stor betydelse för oss som nu. Vi lever i en tid när fakta och vetenskap efterfrågas på viktiga men vittskilda områden som pandemier, klimatförändringar eller ekonomi. Samtidigt skuggas vår samtid av ett växande hot mot tilliten till kunskap. Ogrundade åsikter jämställs ibland med fakta. Falska nyheter sprids med internets hastighet. Polariseringen ökar i samhällsdebatten som ibland har ett så hårt klimat att numera också forskare möts av hat och hot när de presenterar forskningsresultat som går emot vissa personers uppfattning om hur verkligheten är eller borde vara beskaffad. En fri och stark vetenskap är av avgörande betydelse för en fungerande demokrati och en vital offentlig debatt. Varje forskares rätt att fritt välja forskningsämne och forskningsmetod samt att fritt publicera forskningsresultat är en av de byggstenar som skapar vår demokrati. Och i länder där den akademiska friheten kringskärs är själva demokratin i fara. I riksdagen är vi mitt uppe i firandet av vårt flera år långa demokratijubileum som markerar hundra år av demokrati i och med genombrottet för den allmänna och lika rösträtten åren 1918-1922. till Under det här århundradet har Sverige transformerats i grunden till dagens moderna forsknings- och kunskapsnation. 
Jag tror att denna resa inte minst är ett resultat av demokratins införande med beståndsdelar som yttrandefrihet, akademisk frihet och rättsstatens principer. Ärade Nobelpristagare, ledamöter, med damer och herrar, avslutningsvis vill jag som riksdagens talman återigen understryka vetenskapens värde för det vi arbetar med i det här huset. Lagstiftning, politik och demokrati. Olof von Dalins ord i den svenska Argus från 1700-talet har bäring än idag. Gud nåde det land där vett förföljes och ädel vetenskap av mörker överhöljes. Med dessa ord ska jag strax lämna över till dagens moderator, professor Göran K. Hansson. Men först vill jag tacka Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin, Vetenskapsrådet och Nobelstiftelsen för ett mycket fint samarbete inför den här dagen. Varmt tack. Herr talman, ärade riksdagsledamöter, honored Nobel laureates, mina damer och herrar. Det är verkligen glädjande att det anordnas en forskningens dag i Sveriges riksdag. Och det är inspirerande att höra talmannen reflektera över vetenskapens betydelse för beslutsfattandet. Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin, Nobelstiftelsen och Vetenskapsrådet är hedrade över att få vara med och anordna de här seminarierna och vi tackar talmannen för inbjudan. Jag som har fått äran att moderera dagens panelsamtal heter alltså Göran K. Hansson och är Vetenskapsakademins ständig sekreterare. Tidigare idag har riksdagens utskott haft möten med forskare och det har huvudsakligen varit samhällsvetenskapliga forskare som arbetar med frågor som ligger lagstiftningen nära. Och jag har förstått att det har varit mycket givande samtal. Men för den här sessionen ska vi gå över till naturvetenskap. Några av er frågar er kanske varför ni behöver bry er om något så tekniskt och ibland svårgenomträngligt som naturvetenskap. Det frågar sig den brittiske premiärministern William Gladstone också. När Michael Faraday på 1850-talet demonstrerade en ny upptäckt för honom. Elektriciteten. Very interesting, sa Gladstone. But what practical use is it? Och Faraday svarade. Why, sir, there is every probability that you will soon be able to tax it. Idag så vet vi att elektriciteten inte bara har gett upphov till energiskatt utan bokstavligt talat lyst upp eh, hela mänskligheten. Och utforskandet av världen vi lever i har lett fram till hela den moderna civilisationen med alla dess frukter. Mediciner och kommunikationer, eh, teknik och insikter. En helt ny världsbild. Utan naturvetenskapens genombrott skulle livet ha varit oändligt mycket svårare. Och det skulle varit omöjligt att hantera de utmaningar som vi står inför idag. Det ser vi ju inte minst i dagens pandemi. I januari i fjol utforskades coronavirusets gensekvens. Några veckor senare fanns tester på plats. Och mot slutet av året kom de första vaccinerna ut. Nu är vaccinationsprogrammet igång. Och det faktum att det finns leveransproblem och förseningar får inte leda till att vi glömmer vilken fantastisk framgång det ändå är att ett vaccin togs fram på bara ett år och att vi alla bör kunna bli vaccinerade inom några månader. Det visar forskningens kraft. Idag har vi glädjen att ha med oss två verkliga toppforskare. Det är professor Emmanuel Charpentier som fick 2020 års Nobelpris i kemi. Hon deltar via länk från Berlin. Och från München deltar 2020 års Nobelpristagare i fysik, professor Reinhard Genzel. Och vi ska börja med att låta dem berätta om sina Nobelprisbelönade upptäckter. Och sen blir det dags för ett samtal med er och riksdagens ledamöter. Alltså. Vi kommer att föra samtalet på engelska, men det går bra att ställa frågor på svenska likväl. Så ska jag försöka översätta. And with that I'll switch to English. And Professor Emmanuel Charpentier, if I may start with you. Uh, you received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry together with Professor Jennifer Doudna. Uh, of Berkeley, California, for the development of a method for genome editing, the method that's commonly known as the gene scissors, Jean Saxon, and also by technical name CRISPR-Cas. So could you please tell us in a few words what the gene scissors is and how you made the discovery, please?
Okay. So first, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be here to discuss with you science and its uh, critical relevance to society. Uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in Chemistry of last year was awarded for uh, a discovery that is uh, about a technology uh, that uh, allows to perform genetics in cells and organisms. So, in, in principle, an, another level of, of possibilities to modify genes and genomes in cells and organisms. So, it is a very transformative uh, technology and it has uh, been adopted extremely fast by the scientific uh, community just a couple of months after the, the discovery and the release of the technology. This was uh, in 2012, so nearly nine years ago. Uh, the technology has largely evolved since, and uh, it is really allowing to perform genetics in ways that uh, were not possible prior to, to this um, discovery. So it's really changing the field of life sciences, biotechnology, biomedicine. And now what is very interesting is that the technology really originates from pure basic science. Uh, from my side, uh, the, the wish to understand better how bacteria cause uh, diseases in humans. And uh, by uh, looking at different mechanisms involved in, uh, in this uh, understanding, uh, we came across uh, a mechanism uh, that allows bacteria to defend themselves against uh, infection by viruses. So I guess you're familiar with it. <laughs> because of the pandemic time, we can all be infected by viruses. And so do bacteria. They can also be infected by viruses. They have developed... Uh, immune systems to defend themselves against viruses. And one immune system is called CRISPR-Cas. And the understanding of a specific uh, CRISPR-Cas mechanism led to this technology of gene scissors, so acting on the DNA of cells and organisms. Thank you. Now, um, you made a key part of your discovery, perhaps the discovery, when you worked in Umeå in northern Sweden. So, was that a good place for discovery science? Uh, obviously, yes, because this was the most uh, productive time uh, of my career in terms of really impactful research. Uh, obviously, uh, Umeo was able to offer me what I needed at uh, a specific time of my career from the transition of assistant professor to associate professor. And it really offered me... Uh, an environment that I was uh, looking for, that is really an international environment, interactive environment, interdisciplinary environment, an environment that allows really to, to develop uh, research with uh, trust, uh, with also the, the trust in scientists that uh, they can develop risky projects and the means to offer time and funding to develop these risky projects. I just want to, to say that initially, uh, CRISPR-Cas was very much of low interest, maybe, for the overall scientific community, uh, an obscure mechanism uh, related to macrobiology. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Umeo um, yeah, offered me a, a position and offered me the possibility to develop this science. Great. So one more question to you. Uh, what's the practical use? Can you tell us, I mean, I know we all know that there's a lot of possible applications, but could you mention one or two practical applications of the gene scissors? Yes, so first in, in life sciences, I mean, the possibility to modify genes and, and genomes are, it's, it's an essential way to understand mechanisms of life. And this is important, you see it for the vaccination, it really, uh, you know, the new vaccines developed, which are RNA-based vaccines, are really originating from all this research in life sciences at the fundamental level, and, and genetic tools are essential to understand mechanisms of, of diseases. Uh, a practical uh, application is, for example, in biomedicine. The technology is really developed as a, as a medicine uh, to uh, treat uh, genetic diseases uh, through, um, yeah, through uh, a combination of genetic and, and, uh, and cell technologies. So this is a practical application. The other application and that is quite practical as well and, and that is uh, quite uh, welcomed is the possibility to develop 
and, and produce uh, new plant uh, crops, uh, genetically modified in ways that are really different from the, the technology that were used prior to CRISPR-Cas9 to, to uh, engineer this uh, genetically modified organism. So it's really a new way to, to produce uh, clean uh, plant crops. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, so you can modify without leaving any potentially harmful traces in the crops. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, let me switch to you, Professor Reinhard Genzel. You shared the Nobel Prize in Physics last year with Professor Andrea Ghez of Los Angeles for, and I quote now, for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. That's what we usually call a black hole. And uh, another part of the Nobel Prize went to Professor Roger Penrose in Cambridge in England for theoretical discoveries concerning black holes. Now, this is mind-boggling stuff for all of us, so could you please, Professor Gensel, tell us in a few words what black holes are and how you discovered them? Well, I mean, you might look at it from, from two different sides. Uh, one is the physics side, and that has to do with the theory of general relativity, which is now a little over 100 years old. And that theory uh, almost immediately made the prediction that there might be objects uh, where gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape. And of course, initially, that was a purely mathematical uh, result, if you like. And for 50 years, not, not with any application but then the astronomers started uh, looking at the, at the skies in the 1960s and discovered what we now know are two types of these objects. One are burned out stars, which then collapse and form stellar black holes. And the other ones are very much more massive objects, which we now know are almost in every center of, of Milky Ways. And remarkably, both of these, these objects, uh, whilst black in the sense that light cannot escape, can accrete material and thereby become very luminous and affect the evolution of the entire universe. So that's the astronomy side of the research, uh, so to speak. On the one hand, we, we are after uh, still testing uh, the effects of and the truth of the, the theory Albert Einstein has formulated on scales which had not been possible. And on the other side, we're trying to explore uh, our universe of all. Thank you. Now, the, the discovery of a black hole in the Milky Way obviously required very advanced equipment and a big team of scientists that you led. So how do you view the role of international collaboration like this in, in science? How important is it and, and are there any obstacles to it? How does it work? Well, obviously, you know, it depends on the field, uh, etc. Uh, you know, competition plays an important role in science as well, but there are scales of experiments. You might think of particle physics, you might think of uh, space exploration and this parts of astronomy now where the equipment we are using is so costly that not a single institution and certainly not uh, a single researcher can afford it. And uh, in fact, in Europe in particular, I think we have early on after the war seen the advantages of uh, combining forces and thereby over the years uh, enable a research network in astronomy which is on par, I would say, in, in some aspects to that of the United States of America. And so uh, international collaboration in that sense enables doing big and, and, and difficult things. So you would uh, advise the parliamentarians here to continue supporting international projects like CERN or the South Observatory? Oh, please, yes. <laughs> no, I think that's it's very clear that if you look had in particular the European Southern Observatory which, with which we did this experiment, then, you know, that observatory when it was founded in the 1960s was not that important on the world scale. And now it's the biggest and most powerful uh, optical observatory we have. And we are still going further than the, the instruments we already have. And that's only because we have Europe and also now perhaps other countries in the world participating. Great. 
Now, if we broaden the question a bit, uh, Black holes are very different from gene scissors. We see immediate applications of the gene scissors, as we heard from Professor Charpentier. But black holes are, thank God, very, very far from us. So why do we need to know anything about them? And why should parliaments allocate resources to study them? Why should governments support this kind of basic science? Well, obviously, that goes deep into the heart of why we humans are curious and try to understand the universe. I always describe this as sort of a walk through an unknown forest, where we go into the forest and see and discover trees of various types and flowers and so forth. So the exploration uh, of the world around us is something which is innate to us humans and has made humanity what it is now. Now, once we discover that the flowers are there and we start to categorize the flowers, pretty soon you'll discover that the blue flowers are on one side of the path and the red flowers are on the, on the other side of the path. And that starts another phase of that exploration, which is we like to understand. We like to understand and, and, and see what's, what's happening. And then the last phase can be that we understand that the blue flowers actually are good as medicine for certain diseases, and we can apply them. We can uh, uh, build technology out of that. Uh, now, of course, you could say, why didn't we start right away with the technology? You know, or, or why do we care about the red flowers, for instance? Well, uh, you didn't know. And in fact, in some cases, and one of the cases I would say, which is most obvious, is the, is the laser, which is, uh, you know, known to all of us uh, nowadays as a, as a key instrument in industry uh, for surgeons, uh, to, pay, to make the best clocks, to measure the smallest distances, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that laser was developed as, as a lamp to understand molecules. It led to a Nobel Prize by Charles Towns, very famous physicist. But when he, when he developed the laser, he was not interested in building cutting, instrument, cutting tools. He was interested in understanding molecules. So in that sense... Uh, like in the case of Faraday, whom you mentioned, uh, many of the most important applications of, of research come from basic research as a sort of a, a byproduct or as a result of the research. Right, thank you. So perhaps that was a good introduction to the next part of this uh, seminar, uh, the discussion with you parliamentarians. So I would like first to invite the speaker, Dr. Nolén, uh, to make some comments or questions to the laureates, and then we'll go around the uh, chamber here. Please, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the relevance of, oh, sorry, um, thank you for sharing this, uh, sharing your wonderful uh, discoveries with us. Um, uh, the, the title, the headline of this seminar uh, is uh, the, the relevance of science for, for political decision making. And uh, I would say that one, uh, one of many um, important things about bringing scientists and politicians together is to, to increase the mutual understanding uh, of the roles and of how the logics of science and politics respectively. So I was wondering on that note, um, uh, I guess you have had some contact with politicians also during your careers. Um, what would you say are the, uh, the main misconceptions politicians might have regarding science or the role of scientists? Uh, and if I may flip the question or turn it around, uh, have you uh, uh, came, come to understand that, that you have misunderstood politicians in any way? Uh, that the, the logics of politics and the role of politicians are different from what you thought at the beginning. Professor Gensel, would you like to start? Well, okay, I, I would say I, I spend, I, I live part of my time in, in Germany, of course, and part of my time in the United States. 
uh, both countries very powerful in the sense that they have understood, uh, at least in the uh, in in the part of the population who who understand or to think about these uh, uh, pr uh, problems, that research and scientific research uh, in particular, but also other types of research, are important for the progress of the country, uh, are important for keeping the wealth and the good living standards of the country, or even improving it. Now, we've had uh, the luck in Germany in the last uh, 15 years now uh, to have had a leader uh, of the political side who is a physicist. And we've seen in another country, the United States of America, what happens if you have someone who disregards that. And I would say no words need <laughs> to be said. Uh, it's very, very clear that the, you know, many of the, you know, very well thought through uh, uh, actions of our chancellor show what scientists or the influence of science can do. Now, on the other hand, of course, not everything can be done in this way. Scientists are single-minded uh, people. You know, I want to do my research. I see that there are other uh, people who want to do other research. I understand that there has to be, be made a choice, but maybe there is research which shouldn't be done. Maybe there are limits. And so that's where the, the political world obviously comes in. Mm, thank you. Professor Charpentier? Do you have any reflections on, on this topic? Yes, my, my, my reflection is such that, uh, I mean, I, I believe that politicians, as uh, you know, everyone else, understand the, the need for, for science. Um, now, uh, surely there is often, uh, let's say, difficulties to understand that uh, Science is a, is a long process, and with this regard, um, for sure, politicians have more, uh, let's say, a, uh, an agenda that is maybe more <laughs> short or mid-term than, than what science is, that is often uh, short, mid-term, but very much long-term. Um, and so, and, and it, it is totally understandable that it is this very difficult to... <laughs> Acknowledge the fact that a, a scientist needs uh, needs a, a lot of time to to go on with uh, you know uh, that scientists yeah, need a lot of time to go on with their projects and that it may not be rewarding um, you know in uh, within a short time and also I think uh, um, a misunderstanding of what um, you know um, what is rewarding <laughs> means for for scientists. Um, you know, big discoveries as, as, you know, can be made because you have a lot of very small discoveries done by, you know, a large number of scientists. So this uh, has to be acknowledged, even though from the outside, uh, you know, someone who's not a scientist will most likely, uh, you know, wonder what <laughs> some scientists are doing because they will have difficulties to understand, uh, you know, their goal and, and where they want to go. But this, it's, uh, it's important to say, it's, uh, every scientist brings uh, something important into the overall field of science that will lead to important um, uh, discoveries. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a reflection that I, I have. Might, might I add, may, maybe also, that in addition to what Emmanuel just said, uh, there is one area where I think we all need to work together better which is the understanding on the one hand uh, in the scientific community to talk to the politicians and to the world at large, but uh, in the population, not just the politicians, but the population, to understand that science is not black and white, that science progresses, that mistakes can be made and often require very complex uh, decision-making. And to do that uh, complex decision-making right, is, is very, very difficult, as we have just seen over the last 12 months, yeah. right? You can, you can point at saying that, that this mistake and that mistake, but you can also say, uh, just look at, I mean, the, every, every uh, scientist would have told you that the vaccine is, 
is at least three, maybe five years away. Maybe it is not possible to do it. And yet we have vaccines which were already so so brief. But it's a complex uh, it's a complex situation. Yeah. So sometimes science moves fast, but most of the time, as we heard, it builds on many discoveries in a creative environment, and there's need for a long-term perspective in that. Now let's move on, and uh, I'd like to give the word to uh, Gunilla Svantorp, who is chair of the Parliamentary Committee for Education and Science. Ms. Svantorp, please. Thank you, Jöran, and thank you, Professor Charpentier and Professor Gensel, for interesting speech. Um, the speaker took my question, but I, I have another question. Uh, you are two female uh, re researchers who won the Nobel Prize for discovery of CRISP and another of the few female Nobel laureates. Do you see that we are developing towards a more equal academy where everyone is given the same conditions or are we stagnant in development? <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, Professor. Yes, so I, I guess. <laughs> I guess the question is for me. Um, actually, my, my personal experience has been that uh, maybe I was struggling more being a foreigner than being a, a female scientist. And uh, I don't have the impression, actually, that I was struggling more than all my other colleagues. Uh, I think we are all sitting in the same boat and it's a competitive environment and we have to show that we can perform good science and we are uh, you know, encountering the same issues. Uh, I think uh, the scientific field has evolved a lot with regard to at least acknowledging the fact that uh, you know, um, more uh, female scientists uh, you know, are actually present, more, more female students uh, have you know, decided to uh, go on with, uh, with a career in science. Uh, I believe that this uh, has been acknowledged uh, over the last 20 years, at least this is my own experience, and has been developed quite well to allow female scientists, but I would say also male scientists, to be offered conditions to, um, yeah, to develop a career while having to also uh, take care of a family on the side. I think uh, in our days, those issues are not only for um, my female colleagues, but also from my male uh, colleagues. Uh, having said this, it is true that the higher you go in the hierarchy in, in science, the, the more you understand that it's a male environment. Um, and I also have understood that it is not easy for my male colleagues, maybe, to, <laughs> to you know, uh, evolve in, uh, you know, dealing with... Uh, with more female uh, colleagues, but you know there is also an evolution in this regard. Um, I believe that the issue why we are still encountering a low number of female scientists in, uh, you know, in the more the, the higher <clears throat> positions is mainly due to the fact that you have. Uh, but I believe it's not only in science; it's also in other fields. Um, a number of female scientists who abandon their career at some point uh, based on, um, yeah, um, obviously several reasons. And I think this is more where I think one should try to understand why, you know, female scientists decide at some point to, so to stop their, their career. Um, it is true that, yeah, it's a competitive environment and that uh, maybe some, um, you know, female scientists find it too, too harsh, too tough. <laughs> they, yeah, and therefore, they, they abandon and they decide to stop their career. Um, but this, I think, is, is, is something to, to look into a little bit in more detail and try to uh, increase the number of female scientists in higher positions, indeed. Thank you. As, as, a, as a male, old male scientist, may I add, uh, my perspective there, I'm with uh, Emanuela uh, in that I'm very optimistic. Things have been going uh, very positively in this respect. In my field, astronomy, Astronomy, when I started here as a director, uh, I had zero 
zero students, female students and postdocs, uh, zero scientists in my group. Now the number is uh, varying, of course, somewhere between 30 and 35 percent. So I think that's progress, but it takes time. I recall a study uh, which was done at the European <coughs> Microbiology Lab in Heidelberg uh, under varying assumptions when, under which uh, political measures, we would expect equilibrium to occur or parity to occur. And I'm afraid, because of the effects which Emanuele just mentioned, which we typically call leaky pipeline effects, uh, if you appoint at the professorial level, say, from now on equally, it will still take 60 years until you uh, reach a uh, parity. And if you take the leaky pipeline into account, uh, you know, it can even last longer because uh, some females decide at some age all of a sudden to uh, want to take care of other things. So, I mean, they're, they're, we have to work hard, but we have to also be a little patient. I mean, these things take time. Yeah. If I may add, from the point of view of the Nobel Prize, that we've been very concerned, of course, and been criticized that there are few female Nobel laureates in the sciences. And we said we will encourage uh, nominations of female scientists. We want to make sure that they get their fair chance, but we're not going to introduce a quote and say that this year we will only award women or so. And you can see that now, with increasing numbers of women coming in and also doing top-level science, we had uh, last year three uh, female Nobel laureates, and the year before we had several and so on. So it's moving in the right direction. We're not going to polish the statistics, but the statistics will change. Perhaps an, an, an equally big, if not bigger, problem is that science at the highest level is only done in some parts of the world. And that, but that's a topic for another, another session, perhaps. Let me now give the word to Betty Malmberg, who is a Member of Parliament and Chair of the Society for Parliamentarians and Scientists. Betty, thank you very much, and thank you for interesting answers to these questions. <coughs> um, I have a question concerning research uh, policies. And uh, recently, Emmanuel Charpentier mentioned uh, some things about what was good at the uh, Umeå University. And uh, therefore, I wonder if you can point out some parts in your research uh, life that, that have been crucial for your success. Uh, I'm thinking about, for instance, um, government funding, elite uh, investments, international corporations, or role models, perhaps. Uh, could you elaborate something about that, please? Yes, so... Um, you know, the, 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 I mean, my research in, uh, in Umeo uh, was, uh, you know, very much associated to the environment. <laughs> Uh, that was, uh, and that is still his uh, at Umeo University, uh, um, as I said earlier, an international, interdisciplinary uh, environment and very interactive environment. Uh, the reason why I, I chose to apply to Umeo University is that was in the uh, end of 2007, actually, uh, was based on a novel uh, initiative uh, that uh, has led to the Laboratory for Molecular Infection Medicine Sweden at Umeå University. And that was a research initiative based on, uh, on the model uh, of EMBL, the European uh, Molecular uh, Biology Laboratory based in Heidelberg uh, in Germany. And this model was emphasizing uh, the, the need to really bring um, young scientists, international scientists, who will be provided uh, reasonable conditions <laughs> to perform research uh, with a reasonable timeline to be able to develop projects at uh, risk and with an infrastructure uh, that will uh, allow to develop, uh, you know, risky projects. And this is really what I benefited from, uh, you know, at Umeo University. Uh, for sure, with um, governmental funding, uh, provided to Umeå University and then to, <laughs> to um, 
you know, to myself and some of my colleagues. I had projects that uh, were funded by uh, Umeå University uh, with uh, comp uh, competitive um, uh, applications of, of, of projects that will be funded by Umeå University and some other projects which um, had the chance to have been um, 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 seen uh, granted by uh, the uh, Swedish Research Council. Um, it is for sure critical for basic science to have funds uh, coming from you know, the public uh, sector um, because this is the way uh, in Europe uh, you know, basic science is mostly uh, funded and this is critical for the scientists. And um, I believe as well, and this also goes along the question that uh, was asked with regard to uh, female uh, scientists. Um, there is also a need to really reflect on, uh, let's say, how the, the governmental uh, structures have evolved uh, to allow uh, scientists to perform, uh, you know, uh, basic science in, in, in the public sector, and also to reflect on, on the needs of, of the young scientists in our days. So science is evolving very, very fast. Technologies evolve uh, very fast that allow science to develop even faster. And um, it is very, very critical to uh, appreciate the fact that structures need to be extremely dynamic, move very fast uh, in terms of adapting their structure to the needs of the young scientists and the needs for developing better science and better technologies. So one needs to have a very dynamic environment, very progressist environment, uh, with funding that can be uh, provided in a you know, reasonable timeline to have a dynamic research, and also a funding that understands that certain projects need a long time to be developed. So when the funding is provided on a too short basis, uh, or let's say, uh, you know, funding of only one student or one postdoc, this does not allow the development of risky projects. So this is to be uh, kept in mind. And the fact that also uh, our young scientists, and uh, for sure for me, I, I work a lot with very young scientists, and I see a lot of my scientists, I mean the scientists that I have, uh, you know, mentored, uh, deciding to, to leave uh, basic uh, research and and public funded uh, science because they see it uh, quite uh, hard to, they, they don't see really prospective. Uh, they see it uh, very uh, difficult, uh, a very long way to, to, uh, to be um, awarded, uh, you know, uh, uh, sustainability and, and uh, positions that would allow them long term to do sustainable science. And also they see difficult with regard to the funding of, of research. And so this is to be uh, taken into account because in all this we have to consider that we need also to, <laughs> to listen to the, to the young scientists because otherwise we may encounter a time where those scientists will not be present any longer uh, to develop um, the, the science for the future. Uh, I think we need to move on because we have more questions here. Thank you very much. Now we'll, uh, I'll give the word to Christina Yngve, Member of Parliament and on the Committee for Environment and Agriculture. Please. Thank you very much and thank you very much for your work and for very interesting discussions. Uh, I'm also an agronomist, uh, so I have very high, high hopes when it comes to the possibilities of CRISPR-Cas9 and uh, uh, with the crop production. And about 10 years ago, before I was a politician, I was at a farmer's uh, seminar and the then uh, US agricultural attaché in EU, he said about uh, GM crops that Europe loves science but is afraid of the result. And I think when it comes to uh, your work, Professor Charpentier, and how uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, has been treated within the political discussions in EU, that would be, uh, in my opinion, um, a correct statement. So it would be interesting to hear uh, your uh, views on, b both of your views on uh, is uh, politics in uh, Europe uh, 
do we love science but are afraid of the result? And what do you think we need to do in order to not only embrace science but also embrace the results? Thank you. And perhaps not only politics but uh, public opinion and, and uh, pre uh, pressure groups. So, who would like to start on that one? Um, I, like I can start. I can start. So, um, what you pointed out, it, it, it's true. <laughs> People love science, but they are afraid of the result of the science. Um, if, if, you, if you relate on what we are experiencing right now, for example, with uh, RNA-based vaccines, uh, at first, maybe... <laughs> Maybe the people would be afraid of, of you know, technologies involving, you know, for them, new types of molecules. For us, RNA is certainly not a, a new type of molecule. And yet, uh, yet now, uh, everyone is, is uh, very excited by, by this RNA-based vaccines. Uh, CRISPR is an, actually an RNA-based uh, uh, technology. So as, I think uh, uh, what we experience today with the vaccination, but with also all the, the new, new technologies that uh, everyone is using on a daily basis, I think shows to, to a large extent that people should not be afraid of the result of the science and should be glad and happy of, of the result of the science because it really, uh, it really helps us uh, you know, to live in a, in a better world. Um, having said this, for the plants, indeed, uh, uh, the European Court of Justice, and I think uh, you know, all scientists have been disappointed by this decision, have decided that uh, the, the plants, uh, the new crops engineered by um, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, uh, would have to undergo the same regulations than the, the, the crops, the plant crops that uh, would be developed by other types of technology that were used prior to CRISPR-Cas9. So it's for sure a, a disappointment because it's... it's Let's put it that way. It's not about not having regulations. I think uh, it's, you know, one, one needs uh, regulations. It's about understanding that new technologies uh, always need to, to uh, be considered with new type of, of regulations uh, uh, that are according to the new, new technologies that are developed. Uh, the, the regulations have to be, uh, um, you know, evaluated and updated uh, based on the new technologies, so it's not about not having regulations, it's about having regulations that take into account uh, the new development of, of technologies. And, and in this regard, there may be, you know, um, miscommunication between the scientists and the politicians or, or the public, or let's say, as a scientist, who tend to focus on, on, on their science, and because they are judged on the the production of their science, so they tend to, to stay in their lab and, and believe that their main roles are to you know, produce good science and, and uh, <clears throat> most likely a need to encourage scientists to, to engage more discussions with the politicians yeah. and the public. Professor Gensel, do you see similar <laughs> problems in the physics? Yeah, and well, astronomy? okay, I mean, clearly, well, we, are, we are seeing in Europe right now and that's not new, a certain uh, hesitation to take risks. And, and we just discussed uh, some of these aspects. Another aspect is obviously um, the transition from basic research to applications. Uh, if we have the common uh, situation that the basic research gets done in universities and special research labs often or solely funded by by governmental funds, uh, but then we want uh, applications to occur in the private sector, we have to facilitate that process. And if I look at my own country here, then I have to say, my God, what are we doing? The auditors, uh, basically, the, the state auditors, uh, find the possible negative outcomes of conflicts of interest to be much more important than the pot potential uh, of, uh, of making that transition. That's where the United States is really uh, and continues to be uh, way ahead of us. If I, if I look what's happening in, the, in, the, in Silicon Valley uh, and the continuing stream of uh, new talent coming from the universities, being produced by the universities, Stanford, Berkeley, and so forth, into the market which is there and opening up new business uh, venture capital is uh, helping. Uh, that allows for much more uh, progressive uh, possibilities than in our risk-averse uh, good old Europe. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's striking that it's not the discoveries that are missing in, on our continent, but we are not as good at the application side, the development into, uh, well, essence, in the end, into products and company, companies. There is something there that we, where we have a lot to learn from Silicon Valley, I guess. You mentioned when we talked uh, uh, yesterday uh, about the, your experience when you spent part of the year in the Silicon Valley area. Now, opportunities for more questions. While they are thinking, uh, let me ask you um, how, how um, can we best help, we as scientists, best help politicians? What do you think is the role of scientists in the dialogue with politicians? Uh, do you see us as uh, telling politicians what to do or providing uh, a set of facts from which they have to move on, or how, how can we improve the dialogue and what, what's our role? I mean, as scientists, we would like to decide everything often, but we have to be humble and reasonable and accept that we live in a democracy where our role is a limited one, obviously. So thoughts on that? The dialogue between politicians and scientists. Well, we are having a dialogue uh, right now, and I think that's a, a very nice uh, format. Obviously, in many countries, the academies are fulfilling the role of the intermediary uh, advising. That can go well. Um, in Germany, we haven't done very well on that at all, since we didn't have a national academy. The U.S. obviously has, has done very well, I would say. Um, but I, I think, you know, the advising can also happen at the, at the personal level where uh, you know, politicians can, from time to time, uh, bring in a group of scientists and and uh, uh, talk about uh, issues at hand, so to speak, and, and that can be can be a format. But indeed, we, we scientists have to be cautious in not overreaching. Uh, I mean, we've seen this in Germany uh, just now with the the top virologists, uh, and my Emanuela knows more about this than I do. Uh, who, who've been, in my view, very, very good in, in, in explaining the situation. But then they got themselves into the problem that different virologists who have slightly different opinions. And this, this situation, which we know very well in, 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 in science is normal, was not well taken in the public mm -hmm. and considered to be a weakness of the discussion. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Please. Yes, so from, from my side, uh, Let's put it that way. I think it's, it's very difficult to explain, <laughs> you know, the, the, the science. And I, I believe that uh, the media are, uh, you know, do their best to, to explain to the public, uh, you know, uh, the science that is done all over the world. Um, I think that scientists need more, obviously, to express, uh, you know, um, let's say, the needs they have. And most likely, I think, where I believe that there is, a, a, let's say, a zone where of, uh, you know, of misunderstanding, it's not only from the politicians, but it's from the, the public in general, is what is to be a scientist in our days? <laughs> I mean, most of the people who... <laughs> who talk to me, they really think that I'm in my lab doing experiments, etc., or, or doing only science, and I'm doing everything but science now in Germany. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's say, the I, problem I'm, with I'm getting the Nobel Prize, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I'm, I'm trying desperately to do a bit of science, but I mean, it's a lot of management, it, mm. it's a lot of, of, you know, a lot of tasks around the science or so mm. to to, uh, you know, at a higher level for us, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, Heiner Gensler will also tell me the same thing. Our, our role is to provide, a, you know, a nice environment for the young scientists to perform research. And this is a full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have often not uh, enough time to really even speak enough science with our scientists. But I think what is really critical in our days is that uh, the politicians understand uh, 
you know, what are our needs and what are our uh, issues in really, uh, you know, being able to develop the research we would like to develop and maybe the, 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 the problems that we are encountering, uh, you know, in the structures that have been in place for many, many years and certainly need to evolve with regard to uh, the technologies that have evolved, the, the scientists, the type of scientists that we train, who, who have evolved, and as uh, Reinhard Gensel mentioned as well, uh, the, the, the applications of the science that have also evolved. And here the US are, are you know, much better than us to to have a very versatile at least system pragmatic system that uh, allows to really go for the for the killers as they say <laughs> when it is really to to be competitive and uh, and develop top science for top applications right and perhaps we as scientists can also learn from politicians uh, and that's something we have done today, I think. Uh, I hope you have had as much fun as I have had. So thank you very much. And now I'll stop there and give the word to the speaker. Well, thank you. I would like to thank, of course, our distinguished guests, Nobel laureates, for, for attending this seminar today. I guess uh, digital technology and, and the discoveries that have led us to, to be able to build a digital system of communications throughout the world uh, has helped us or uh, facilitated this conversation today and made it possible for us to, to have a dialogue with you, although you are in, in uh, not other parts of the world perhaps, but at least in other countries and, uh, than, than we are. Uh, so. That's one uh, of so many examples of, of how science can make our lives better. Uh, thank you so much for participating. I would also like to thank the, the um, chairs of the various committees of the Swedish Parliament for their attendance here today and for, for embracing the idea of, of a day devoted or, uh, to science. Uh, and I hope that uh, the, uh, the seminars you have all had in your respective committees this morning have also been interesting and, and productive. Um, we mentioned, or you mentioned, uh, professors, uh, that science takes time. But on the other hand, I guess, uh, uh, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Einstein, everything is relative. So I'm, I'm currently, I have a five-year-old year back home, and he is right now very interested in dinosaurs, as many children tend to be at that age. And, and the dinosaurs were extinct 66 million years ago. So I guess a year or a decade, more or less, uh, to create scientific advancement is not that much uh, at all, uh, really. And I guess the world, Professor Gensen, that you are, you are studying, uh, I mean, the, the Earth was created 4.7 billion years ago. So I think, I think we're, we have plenty of time left uh, to, to, to explore this world and beyond it. Thank you so much for, for uh, being here today, and thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.